Hi there. Welcome to the introduction to Synapse video. And if you want to know more about Synapse and what we're thinking about and where we're headed, this video is probably for you. Um, I'll go through uh, our thinking of why data and machine learning matters. And I'll give you some examples of economies that are created around that and uh, utilities from that, as well as overall what that system starts to look like. So uh, we'll start off with some of our, our observations. This is always a good, good place to start. Um, and most of these gonna, are gonna be in diagram form, so uh, it'll be easier for you to visualize rather than just like reading the yellow paper or reading the white paper and trying to wrap your mind around this, right? I think uh, diagramming this out is uh, probably the easiest way to come to terms with what we're building. So we'll start off with the traditional model of how things exist now. So we have companies that exist in silos. So we have these big companies that uh, have apps that we download and we participate in. And each one of these apps connects back to the company, the service, right? All companies, right now this is a very centralized uh, a, a company experience, a, a centralized technology. Um, so us as users, we have these apps on our phone and each one of these apps um, basically interacts with uh, the company's backend to create data about that user, how the user uses that application and uses that service. And this data can be anything from your usage to uh, your email to who you meet up with, uh, events you attend, whatever it is about you. You're literally, as you go through life, you're shedding information uh, like a cloud around you. So uh, each app get, feeds data to this company and you have companies like Facebook and uh, Amazon and uh, Google that uh, use that data to create custom machine learning models, machine learning models and algorithms that are used to then um, provide a service back to you, right? So they're creating an economy with, within their own ecosystem, right? A walled garden, so to speak. And, uh, but it only stays within this, this silo, right? And, and so if you have one AI here, right? And one AI here, this, this machine intelligence doesn't benefit from the data accumulated and acquired from another app. You just can't do it, right? There's no open sharing. There's no open model between these. There's a wall. Right, each one of these is siloed. So that's a very traditional um, way that people interact and engage and give data and build models for these companies. And they use that model to tune services, provide uh, service back to you. And that's how, so for free services, that's how you basically pay. You pay for your, with your data. Uh, this is a traditional model. And so we thought, you know, there's this really cool new thing out there that allows for decentralization. If the old model was about centralized services, there's a new paradigm that's happening. And it's called, um, it revolves around what I call the three Ds. Decentralization, democratization, and distributed kind of compute or storage and things like that. Basically, we start to view a, a middle layer on top of all devices and all participants that basically shift um, the, the ownership and the power from companies back to the people. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, well, I, I guess we'll, that's basically the theme of this entire thing. So we wanted to decouple data access um, and the machine learning models. And our first step was building a marketplace around that. So I'll, 
I'll show you what this means. So we'll, so right now, uh, in a decentralized way, <clears throat> you have companies, and we'll start off with just talking about the data portion, right? Once you decouple data from those applications and services, uh, you start to see cool new emergent features. And they still have their machine learning models inside the companies. And now, um, what you'll see is because your access lives now on the blockchain, where you can have uh, contract fulfillment, um, access control and provenance uh, happening across here, uh, you can create an, an open marketplace, right? Where you can have contract fulfillment for data acquisition, uh, provisioning of resources, things like that, that happen in the open. And uh, allows a new competitive model to exist, right? So, we'll draw out what these mean. And uh, and these arrows that, that come back, or it basically means that processing and everything is still happening within the companies themselves. And they're still hosting these models and still collecting this data and refining models locally, right? Uh, and we'll, we'll see how, so this is the first disruption quote unquote disruption. When data, when there's an open and free marketplace for data, uh, you get the ability for people to compete for the true value of your data. Um, and right here, we say user and, you know, technically we should start saying agent. Agent, in our case, because we want to start thinking beyond apps, right? We want to stop, uh, start thinking beyond just the, the data that we can collect from the apps that we host ourselves on our phones and things like that. And we want to start thinking about, well, how do machines participate, right? How do, um, you know, sensors participate? Because now we're starting to see that there's a whole economy out there for data. Right? Not just from users, but also sensors, from machines, from robotics, from companies, like it could be anything. So now, instead of you giving your data to one company, the access control list and data provenance now happens on the blockchain. So they, what they do is these companies submit a contract proposal to provision uh, access to your data, to get access to your data. And uh, some of the components of this part that you have to build in order to see this through, well, you need a blockchain. And this is where the decentralization comes in. Uh, decentralization is basically where you have a bunch of different nodes participating how they will uh, with kind of access to this chain that they have. Uh, so they all participate to listen to on the blockchain and there's a, these events that occur, right? Namely contract fulfillment at this point. And uh, they decide to parse that and, and do what they will with it. So um, let's see. Right, uh, so now you have access control happening on this blockchain. We'll just call it blockchain, which also, you know, coincidentally enough, like this is the entire marketplace lives on a, in a smart contract on the blockchain. So that when anyone engages with it, the events that happen, happen on, you know, maybe the Ethereum uh, VM. Um, so, all of the people listening to it can subscribe or 
uh, can see a contract that's coming in so that they can participate in fulfilling it, right? So, um, so some of the things you need, your blockchain, which is this, which is where the marketplace resides. Um, you need, uh, obviously cryptocurrencies are how people get their contracts fulfilled, how people participate on the network. Um, you need a lookup. So we talk about a contract, but you need a, a database of sorts that has uh, access to what kind of data is out there. What can you subscribe to? What can you submit a contract for? So we have to have a database of interfaces, uh, data available uh, through those interfaces, services. So we have an ontological database that uh, basically uh, acts as kind of a schema for what's available. Uh, so emergent features So emergent features here um, you know we have contract fulfillment uh, access control And provenance. And why is provenance important right now? Provenance is important right now. And what provenance is, it's basically because all access is granted through this public blockchain, the people can see how they've contributed, who has access to what data, right? So every contract is basically an open statement of one company requiring data from another agent down here. And ultimately, we can conceive of all of the participants on the network as agents. And that's, that's a word you'll hear more and more. So it's not like a secret agent. It's not like uh, the FBI or something. It's just, we're just, that's a name for a participant. It could be actor, it could be any name, right? Uh, so an agent is any participant on the network. Okay, so we've talked about data. There's kind of a, uh, this is the most naive kind of economic model where people are just buying and selling access to data, but it creates, it then creates these, these companies that are, are again siloed. And if they, those companies decide to uh, offer those AIs in return, that's great, but you're only ever accumulating from the data that you require and you can't really, it's not really open. Um, so, you know, let's, let's see what happens next. So we start talking about Start talking about open models and the economy of open models. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'll give you an example. So just as this is our, our blockchain and our, where our market exists. And I'll give you an example of what can happen when we start opening up access to these models and start building open models. So previously we saw that, uh, you know, the, the uh, models still existed within companies and that's, that's fine, uh, but the company still had access to apps and you didn't really see model only companies there. And uh, we can start thinking about, you know, I'm using uh, AI as a catch all statement, even though the you know, uh, machine learning is a subset of AI. So um, we'll just use AI because that also embodies and accompany, uh, accompanies like um, uh, agents or autonomous agents or just anything, any intelligent application, right? But ultimately, you can think of this as machine learning, machine intelligence. So what we do now is in order to create uh, open models and what we're calling open models you have uh, users participating that have some data 
available uh, that can be contracted out. So like, let's say this is AI0, AI1, AI2, um, and this is data zero, and this is uh, a contract that AI0 has uh, submitted to the blockchain uh, after it does an ontological lookup on what uh, devices are actually available uh, and what services and interfaces and data is available. And this, this client, this agent, again, we can take away user, just say agent. This agent says, I have that data, let me participate. And then it submits uh, an opportunity for this uh, data to be used to train this intelligence or even used to um, interact with that intelligence, right? So that's a pretty interesting feature. So let's say uh, data moves up to train the AI. We'll say that's training, that little arrow back. Um, and then it submits itself as a service, right? It says, hey, I'm an AI. I'm, I wanna uh, submit this machine learning model that I have available uh, into the ontological database. Um, you know, we can talk about uh, reputation systems and uh, what grading machine learning models are uh, or looks like. Um, so it says, okay, well, I'm available. And another app sends a request, creates uh, a contract for the AI zero. This is, I'll just say, a machine learning zero, right, for AI zero. And uh, it creates one of these contracts. So I need access to this, this AI that's been trained using this data from this agent, right? This app uh, then provisions this AI, this AI goes back. Um, so you have a flow of money, right? So the money goes to this agent and because now we have provenance, uh, you're able to create this, this economy of uh, kind of a, a cyclic economy is what we're calling it. Where the data that's going to be used to train machine learning models and those machine learning models that are then used inside of these apps, we can also call these other agents, right? So like we said before, agents can be uh, users, apps, robots, whatever, right? Um, because now this machine learning that's been trained by this data has been used by this agent and this agent has paid for it, uh, an open model then provides an opportunity to pay back those people that participated in training that model. So if you go to train an artificial intelligence because of provenance, because everything is on the blockchain, you can create an economy of royalties, essentially. So um, it probably looks something like this. Where this is some weight, depending on uh, participation, and this is some uh, particular agent's output or participation. Uh, so how basically how much the agent has participated in training this, as well as like uh, the agent itself. So. Um, or this weight could be uh, some parameter of um, how good of an actor they are. So basically part of the reputation system. This parameter can vary, but this is essentially the output of that agent. And you sum all of those up and you essentially get uh, this, this royalty economy that starts working out. So you can imagine now it's not just about data, but it's about intelligent services, right? And how we're creating a network of things that are negotiating, provisioning one another, and also growing, right? So you have a bunch of people participating, simultaneously training these things. These agents that can provision 
as well as uh, create a, a loop, a feedback loop that goes to uh, helping to train this and make this intelligence better. But that's just the beginning. And that's, that's kind of where Synapse is now and where it will be in the near, near future. But the cool stuff is you have these emergent economies that can happen and emergent features that you can build on top of something like this. And we've just now talked about how the blockchain can be used and how we create these kind of naive economies and we create these icon uh, economies of intelligence, uh, which is how we came up with the phrase AI economies, right? Uh, prior to us, there was like one other research paper that used it and um, but that's where you, you see the phrase AI economy come from. So next we'll talk about, just slightly, talk about contract chaining uh, and kind of what this means to the future of uh, resource allocation, uh, autonomous uh, agents, and uh, the, the future, basically. So um, we talked about we ha now have the blockchain, right? Which acts as provenance and access control and all that cool stuff. And what's cool about this, what we're building is there's programmatic access to this. And what that means is you can build algorithms, you can build bots that interact with this. And you'll, you'll see why that is super neat. Um, so let's say a user, right, we'll, we'll narrow the scope down from <clears throat> uh, agents, so company users, uh, robots, uh, apps, an agent again is anyone that participates on this network. But we'll, we'll use this example, we'll just say it's a user. So imagine a user once to interact with a chatbot, right? Pretty simple example. It says, okay, behind the scenes, it says, I want to interact with this chatbot. I need this directive to happen. I have some, uh, my app is requiring access to this uh, machine intelligence. Maybe I want to classify something. Maybe I, I want to participate in, um, in the dialogue. Uh, I need to hold up my ID. It needs to do some identification. Uh, the next dialog box, it needs to identify particular symbols. Um, it needs to engage with me in some way, probably uh, linguistically, uh, natural language uh, processing is a big thing. So um, let's say that this chatbot, this is, let's say this is the NLP chatbot, right? Natural language processing. So uh, we create a contract, we provision this, and we start engaging with it, right? We ask it a couple of questions. Well, because this lives in this ontology uh, and on this blockchain and can be provisioned and all machine intelligence can be provisioned here, we then can see some really cool things where uh, now we get to a point where this AI is contracting this AI. So we'll say this is C0 and this is C1, contract, contract. And uh, this is our app. So the programmer that created this intelligence, or even the intelligence itself, which is kind of a cool emerging quality, if they can identify a feature or something that it lacks, it can then go back and provision something else to fill in the blank. So it can provision on the, on the blockchain to engage with this, uh, provision this AI and provide this new interface, this new service through this other AI. We're connecting AIs to grow and learn together. I think that's pretty cool. So um, that's just one of the cool features that can happen here. And we'll, we'll talk about um, beyond the feature 
that can happen on this blockchain as is when we start talking about capturing directives. Now, we have seen uh, Amazon Alexa and Google Home have recipes and things that get you to program uh, basically uh, directives are, are rules uh, so we'll just say it's a kind of a decision tree right so we have rule one rule rule uh, sorry rule zero because you know programmers count from zero uh, rule two and uh, what it starts to look like is like okay Uh, it starts to look like something like this. We can have like R3. It doesn't have to be acyclic. Um, you know, we can see see a graph kind of uh, like that uh, emerge when we're talking about directives. And uh, what this basically is, is these are uh, decisions that need to be made in order to accomplish some goal. So we have a task and a directive that leads to some goal. So um, if we can capture that, right, if now we can start making models of how are these services contracting one another? How are developers building on this thing? We can start modeling probabilistically these, uh, these services, these directives. So um, it'll look like something like this. So each one of these is a decision. This is We'll just call this our, our network of decisions. And this is our goal. We start off with some task, and these are just directives, right? Or, or actually, let's call this our directive. And these are a set of tasks that need to be accomplished to reach our goal. Now, if each one of these is a different contract on the blockchain, different intelligence even, could be, um, we can start to see pointers, right? Because everything's written, different contracts point to different uh, services that are provisioned, different people are subscribing, because everything's written to the blockchain, we can start noticing the patterns of how we go from one directive and goal to another. And what's really cool there is because we have, now we're considering a network of reputation, we can start to optimize this. So let's say that this is, uh, these are AI, right? These are machine learning models this goal and uh, now what's really cool is this has some let's say it has some agency to some resource um, it could be like your vehicle it could be where your vehicle recharges your autonomous vehicle uh, how your home robotic uh, help works how it engages with things um, we could then replace this in a competitive market by figuring out how to optimize this chain. All this is is a chain, and now we're optimizing this. So that's where we start seeing something like a global autonomous logistics and supply chain, because not only is it an AI, a chain of intelligence, but you can also have an algorithm that's kind of, if you've studied cybernetics, we have uh, something called second order cybernetics, which not only considers the system by which these agents exist in, but also the system that observes that system. So we have a second order artificial intelligence, a second order machine learning model 
that can optimize for this chain. And that's pretty cool. And so uh, it's kind of, this is a, the trillion dollar idea in my opinion, because this impacts so many different things across so many different industries that uh, when executed successfully, it can change a whole lot. So we see companies like Amazon and Google already starting to think towards that path. Uh, and they just haven't gotten there yet. And, um, but it's coming. So um, again, how the Synapse network works. Let's say you have a car, right? And your vehicle is an autonomous vehicle. So it requires Site, computer vision, uh, sensor information. We'll just make this a sensor. Um, let's say sound. That's an ear. Uh, maybe even touch, right? It requires this access to these models to facilitate either classification, uh, you know, whatever it could be engagement it could be you know a, a model of uh, how humans think uh, so um, it could provision all of these services from synapse right download the models locally use the models and remote depending on the type of uh, the size and compute required to participate uh, in using that model but the cool thing about synapse is if you have these open models well the when this one learns when this one creates something right when it refines this model you know let's say the the computer vision model when it refines that model uh every agent in the network benefits so we've seen something like that before in google's federated uh machine learning on their devices uh that they they've had some research about but now it happens in a very open and decentralized way. So we're back to thinking about decentralization, distributed compute, and democratic access to machine models. And ultimately, one of the big ideas here is that because these companies are inherently biased because they have a business model, they create a funnel for biased data, right? Because they have an audience that they have to have participate on uh, to consume their service, they have a target demographic, um, their models are inherently biased. So we're looking at, like we, we did before, where we had these siloed companies and they're, they're all building, you know, their own AIs using user zero, you know, of a particular demographic. Uh, user three is a, a totally different demographic, right? And these models will all inherently uh, be flawed in some way because the, the audience themselves are biased because of the system that they participate in. It's a requirement of the system, essentially. And so when you go to open this up, you get more robust models because you get more robust data and more access to data globally. So you can represent, you know, the whole of humanity, if you'd like. But you also have provenance to go back and still collect data on particular demographics if you need something of a particular context, right? Of accents, of, of things like this. So um, that's kind of a big introduction to Synapse real quick. And I'll